Why are black women in the UK four times more likely to die from complications in pregnancy and childbirth than white women? Deaths among women from Asian backgrounds also two times higher than for white women. Well, today we'll ask why this is happening to so many women. To what extent is it the result of unconscious bias? She was always full of dreams, full of energy. She had so many ambitions. I asked and begged and pleaded for hours for pain relief. And I felt like I had to make myself feel much smaller um, to compensate for, you know, the angry black woman. He went to the nurse's station and quite explicitly was told, haven't you read the books? Can't you read? Covert racism, I'd say it's extremely dangerous and it's the, almost the hardest thing to explain, to show, to prove, because it's so subtle and it's very, it's very quiet. For a person of colour in the United Kingdom, I'd say it happens frequently. It was havoc, it was kind of, you know, screams, it was everyone calling for the nurses. In those moments, the, the nurses that were there during the day who are now off duty officially came over and actually stood over and said, not my problem, I'm not on duty, and walked away. Maternal health, or the lack of it, is one of the starkest examples of ethnic disparities in the UK. At least one of those two lives could have been saved if they had taken her pleas, her cries, his pleas, his cries seriously, but they didn't. The Embrace report shows that there are ethnic disparities in maternal care and what we also know is that black and ethnic minority women are paying with their lives for a lack of focus on uh, racial bias in this area. And it's highlighted the fact that inequalities do exist in our maternity uh, services. It's a really difficult read, um, really disappointing, um, upsetting, I feel quite emotional about it. Uh, we have just under 600,000 births in England every single year and our absolute priority is to ensure that every woman, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of socioeconomic status, has safe and personal maternity care. And these data tell us that we have much to do. We want every woman and baby and person who births to have the outcomes that are equal to those women that have the best outcomes. One of the things that I always admired about her was that she was always full of dreams, full of energy. She had so many ambitions. Serena and Usman met through work. And I remember the day she sat me down and told me that she's in love and she wants to get married to Usman. She got pregnant quite early. Um, she was surprised. So I think the first scan was the point where the reality hit and the happiness really came out. They bought all the baby stuff, new rugs, new, you know, the car, the usual stuff. She, she continued to do her exercises. So she still did her walk. She still went to the gym. Very healthy pregnancy. I think it was around 10 o'clock in the morning, you know, she went in, checked over, had the medicine to induce. So initially it was all good. You know, the right advice was given. She started feeling quite uncomfortable quite quickly, and like hot and cold, um, feverish quite quickly. You know, there's no signs of baby moving or coming or anything like that. And so by early evening, she's getting more and more uncomfortable. Usman was going to the nurse's station like any anxious father and they'd dismiss him and quite explicitly was told, well, haven't you read the books? Can't you read? There was one statement around, um, around tolerating pain 
the, the innuendo there was around, well, people like us should be able to tolerate more pain. And when what people like us, what does that even mean? Um, and so I've seen this in other spaces and, you know, where people are told that people like us, what does that mean? We experience it on a day-to-day -day basis in employment, at work, going to the shops. And so when we then feel like, OK, we're pregnant now, where, you know, we're in a, in a crucial point in our lives where we should, you know, have access to respected care. It still shows us ugly head. Covert racism is still there. I think it manifests itself in kind of all walks of life and all aspects of life. And you notice when something goes wrong, then it really rears its head. And it's not as, you know, blatant as somebody calling me the N-word whilst giving birth. Covert racism is a black mother asking for pain relief and you know that she's in incredible pain, but you believe that she's strong, she can handle the pain. It's an emotional uh, experience labour, so I don't know if I was as assertive um, as I would usually be in, in everyday life. There's this sort of... Um, notion that black women have higher pain thresholds so pain relief is delayed but that in the long term can cause trauma you know she's had a poor birth experience and that will live with her for a long long time and I remember after giving birth I just knew that 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 went really really wrong got horribly wrong and I didn't know what to do but it kind of led me on to have undiagnosed postnatal depression. So I was really isolated. Every time I spoke about my birthing experience, I, it brought up horrible memories and I would cry and feel very frustrated. The stillbirth rate is the lowest it's ever been. You know, our maternal mortality rate has reduced, our neonatal death rate has reduced. However, for some groups, uh, black women, black African, black Caribbean women, there are no improvements and indeed for their babies. So we have much to do to close this inequality gap. Unconscious biases are something that we all have. They sit deeply within our subconscious and they're triggered to help us make decisions. The problem comes when these um, biases overrule our ability to make safe judgments. And I believe professionally and personally we all have our biases and it's very important that that is acknowledged. As um, midwives, obstetricians, anyone working within the maternity system, it's important that we realise that. Unconscious bias is a very problematic term uh, for a number of different reasons. Firstly, we know conscious bias exists and that needs to be acknowledged. Secondly, when we have unconscious bias training, for example, when that unconscious bias becomes conscious, it doesn't necessarily mean that some action will be taken with regards to it. You know, just because I am South Asian doesn't mean I don't have a bias. It's, it's across the board. And I think it's knowing and wanting to change that, you know, wanting to be like, okay, you know, I want to unlearn this behavior because it's problematic. When we allow our unconscious biases to influence our judgments, that can have a huge impact particularly within maternity. For change to happen, you have to change what isn't within yourself. And you have to accept that not everything that you believe and what you're brought up with and your environment is actually valid. Sometimes I question myself as to whether it's my own perception, but then I also kind of recognise that maybe other people aren't recognising or thinking about things in that way because they've not had to. Um, and, and I guess that is that bias, isn't it? When you're not thinking about, um, when you, do, you don't have to think about race as an issue. Whereas, whereas I always have kind of led my whole life, my whole career through this filter. Uh, and, uh, and I've had to go to other people and say, you know, is, is this something? I question myself, is this something that you see or could be there? Am I seeing this just because I'm, I'm colouring my own perception? can you possibly see this as well? And, and, and in a lot of cases, people will say, actually, you may be right.
I think it was 2019 when the report was done on, with a sub-analysis looking at social economic impact factors and realised that even if you um, took these all out and unfortunately um, black and brown women were still um, more likely to die. So it was from that point I think that people then started to look at solutions so they couldn't essentially blame it on sort of social deprivation or um, social economic or poorer communities. We had to look in at ourselves and really look at the systems that we deliver these care in to see are they fit for the communities that we serve. The other expecting mothers on the ward saw and witnessed what was being said, what was being done and how Serena was struggling and how the nurses were ignoring her. We're looking at around 8 o'clock in the evening now and semi-conscious, sweating buckets, in pain, um, her facial colour has changed, pale, the lip colour is changing. We can see that but they're not hearing us. They're not listening, they're not even observing that. They're just saying it's normal. They just kept saying it's, you know, this is now um, something that you have to tolerate. It's what mothers do. And it wasn't the words, it was the way the words were said. The tone, quite insulting. So then came, uh, then came the point of the nurses changing over and Usman went to the station again and he was told, you know, this is what's happening, you'll just have to wait. Serena collapsed. It was havoc, it was kind of, you know, screams, it was everyone calling for the nurses, the nurses came, they pressed the emergency button to sort of call the crash team. The, the nurses that were there during the day who are now off duty officially came over and actually stood over and said, not my problem, I'm not on duty, and walked away. The other expecting mothers were immediately moved out um, because it was quite horrific, it was traumatic to see what was going on. The doctors have arrived, um, they're preparing for a C-section there and then on the floor. They put the mask on her face, but they forget to switch on the oxygen. So it, her brain has been starved of oxygen during whatever she's going through. She's collapsed, uh, she's having heart failure, she's had a stroke. You know, we find these things out afterwards, obviously. But the C-section's happening there and then on the floor. So you can imagine the doctors having to perform there and then. The baby's delivered, unfortunately stillborn. The doctor uh, delivers this baby and looking around to see who's going to take the baby, where's the trolley to put the baby, nothing, no one. And so he had to run with baby in hand to the maternity ward um, while others then dealt with Serena. So there's chaos, absolute chaos. And then the next thing I remember and know is that Serena's taken to the operating theatre. At some point during that day the uterus had burst and the baby had dropped so there was internal bleeding going on. So all those symptoms that she had could have been picked up and weren't because of the attitude, because of the arrogance, because of the profiling, if that's I can call it that, that these nurses had. Um, so baby didn't survive and Serena didn't survive. My, the logic side of my brain tells me that could have been prevented. At least one of those two lives could have been saved if they had taken her pleas, her cries, his pleas, his cries, seriously, but they didn't. It's not about somebody designing the system that is purposefully biased against a certain group of people. It's about setting up a system based on the information that you have that therefore doesn't meet the needs of the people. So for example, if we look at the NICE guidance for treatment of blood pressure in pregnancy, the first line treatment is labetalol, a beta blocker. Um, if we look at the evidence for that, and perhaps within the research that was done, what proportion of that research had um, the true ethnic mix that it needed? Um, because now we have a guidance which actually has a first-line treatment, which is not always the best for a black population, where we know calcium antagonists work best. 
then that's a perfect example. So now we need to ensure that you know, curriculum and training and everything is is appropriate for everybody. And I can give you an example of jaundice. The way jaundice is taught is using a white baby, um, teaching, you know, the health professional how to recognize jaundice in a white baby. But it's 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 very different in brown skin. It's very different in black skin. And this is where things can be missed. And now becoming comfortable to have those uncomfortable conversations. For example, black babies and brown babies are not born pink. And how do we assess that? So we are now looking at black and brown you know, teaching equipment that represent the community they serve. So for me personally, it is important that we educate our workforce. At one time, our education was very much focused on a white woman um, going through a physiological process of pregnancy and childbirth. Um, we now recognise that we need to look holistically at the women accessing our care. We need to consider their personal history as well as their ethnicity. At our trust, we have set up a continuity of care at midwifery team to provide an enhanced care package to women of a black and Asian ethnic minority background. We've recognised that women from this group are particularly vulnerable of an ad for adverse outcomes during the perinatal period. So wherever you are, it does not matter where you find yourself in the country, you know, as long as you're midwives and your obstetrician, you're able to provide the same care for this group of women. And it is important we keep that and we make it standardised so it doesn't become a postcode lottery. With my training, um, that, was, that was an interesting route because it's not really expected of a Chinese person to go into something that isn't recognised as a, a, a good qualification or a good career. Like I face backlash from the community for choosing midwifery as a profession because it's dirty, I was unmarried and I shouldn't be talking about these things which are taboo. I was just grateful to get a place and I'm not going to challenge that. You know, I worked hard for it and, and I didn't challenge behaviours whilst I was a student. I was the most visibly non-white person in my cohort and that always felt like quite a, a difficult step um, to raise in clinical psychology to reflect upon. I often felt as though maybe I wasn't supposed to be there. Providing healthcare during the pandemic has been a challenge. We know from uh, UCOS data that if you're black and pregnant, you are eight times more likely to be in hospital ill with COVID. If you're Asian, you're four times more likely to be in hospital pregnant with COVID. And so we wrote to maternity providers in England asking them to implement four COVID actions. And these actions aren't just for COVID, they will ripple through many, many decades to come. And these are ensure that you have a conversation with the woman about vitamin D insufficiency. Anybody that is non-white may have vitamin D insufficiency and we want women to be in optimum health and have good immune systems. So it's really important to have those conversations. The second action is about culturally competent communication. Making sure that the communication that you share from your trust, from your maternity provider, is culturally competent with language that people understand in different languages that meet the needs of the population. There is no point in starting the message in English and asking somebody to click on a button to find information, for example, in Urdu. The third COVID action, health professionals need to lower their threshold for referral and also think about when a woman shares their experiences about how they're feeling, listen, understand and act. And the acting with this COVID action is about lowering your threshold for referral and admission. Don't explain things away. Embrace really helps us to understand how sometimes problems are explained away. Don't explain them away, act. So when that person walks through that consultation door, whether they're wearing a hijab, whether they're wearing a tracksuit, whether they're suited and booted, listen, listen, really listen. And the last COVID action 
is about recording and data. Ensure that you add the appropriate ethnicity when you're adding your ethnic coding. Don't guess. Ask the woman what ethnic origin they are that they would like to be recorded on their records and record that. And also to ensure that you record any comorbidities or any challenges in relation to health profile at the moment. That's really, really important. Race and ethnicity are very complex issues and we need people to really have open and transparent conversations around what it means uh, to be uh, of a black or Asian uh, background or a white background and not be tied up in knots in terms of what to say, what not to say, but be open about their journey. I think it's really important to, for people to recognise there are British people who are from a different race. Um, if you would say the human race is made up of, we're all one human race actually, but there are elements of us which are British and there are elements of us that sit in another culture and I think sometimes the offence that sometimes occurs when people don't recognise that people are British. So they will ask a very genuine question, where are you from? But in saying that question, it's like saying that you're not British. So it's important to recognise, OK, you, you know, you've grown up here. What other culture mixes with being British? And that's a really nice open-ended question that you can use to really start to delve into somebody's other side of of their life. Just start the conversation. It doesn't necessarily be, need to be about race initially, but getting to know that person, you will get to know what their race is. It's about being brave and have that courage, you know, to listen to this other view and to be able to speak about your experiences, speak about race. This isn't about learning the detail of every single culture uh, across uh, the UK, but it's about having compassionate care for everyone. And that's not just patients, and communities, but it's compassionate care for each other within the workplace as well. In this year, I've, I've actually stepped up and, and kind of felt a bit braver to step into those shoes and say, actually, I need to, to ask you, my colleagues, um, whether you see what I see, am I being, am I being coloured by my own perceptions? And that has been a conscious step. For me, the best case scenario for the future is that when I approach the maternity services for myself as a service user, that I, as a South Asian woman, do not become one of them statistics. It's the value of diversity. It's that, um, that mixing of thought, the mixing of ideas. So for me, the best case scenario is that people start to understand that it doesn't just benefit that person, that ethnic minority, but because their health is better, it benefits you because the cost of the system is less. Um, therefore, the time for somebody to care for you is less. The burden on the healthcare setting is less. So it's really for everybody to understand that it benefits all of us. It's about every one of us in this together. You know, and it's not going to be business as usual any longer. You know, across the country, I see white women, white mothers. They are very uncomfortable with this data. We all want that change. And that is the reassurance in it. We, want, we all want to reduce the gap, the inequality gap. We all want to have a maternity service that is safe for all. It would be easier for people like me, people like us as a family to move on and feel more optimistic, because I do want to feel optimistic, but with, that would be helped if we had that kind of closure or conversation and respect. If there was one thing that I could change within maternity is that we would treat all women as individuals without bias. Um, I'm hoping that as time goes, goes on, the stats for black women will start to level out, that we won't have such a high negative disproportionate outcomes for black women. Um, I'm also hoping that a lot more dialogue can happen, honest conversations between maternity services and the community of black mums around what we want to see in maternity services and care. What midwives, obstetricians and all those who work in maternity services do will ripple through generations. Being a midwife is the best profession in the world. You, you're sharing in the, you know, in the joy of having a new life. It's, it, it's phenomenal.
it's phenomenal, it's phenomenal. This is our time, this is our opportunity to make that ripple count, make that contact count, so that we have finally women, people, babies and their families feeling that they are valued and respected and that's demonstrated in their maternity outcomes and their experiences.